The bending is so cool. No, 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 no. Wow, okay, that was anticlimactic. Um. Hey, it's Megan, welcome back to On Writing. If you're new here, I'm a professional writer, fiction editor, and writing coach. Since I did a review of the first episode of Avatar The Last Airbender, the animated series, obviously we have to take a look at the first episode of the new live action version. This series is near and dear to my heart. I love it so much. So obviously I was very curious to see how the live action would go, especially given that the movie version was, um, well, mostly I'm curious to see from a writing point of view how they take the story and make it different from the original because there are just things you can get away with in storytelling when it's for kids and it's animated that you can't necessarily get away with in the same ways in a live action, all audiences type of story. So I'm excited to see what they adapt and what they don't. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that it's good. Okay, let's take a look. Oh man, oh. we're not gonna watch all of it because it's an hour long and y'all, y'all have lives to lead. So we'll do a little bit of like beginning, middle and end. Okay, just giving you a little outline. We're starting in media res, in the middle of things with action, that's good. Completely different beginning than the original. Who is this? Look at that! Oh my gosh! Their outfits are so cool. But so legit! <laughs> oh, he's the Earthbender! This is awesome. <gasps> that is so cool. <laughs> Look at their ostrich horses. That's cool. Yes! The bending is so cool! Head that to the Earth King. They're going to start a war. Oh, how interesting. Okay, so we're actually starting the story a hundred years before the animated series started with the, like, onset of the war that the Fire Nation starts. Ooh! This is great because it really is something that was missing from the animated series. You got a lot of it in flashback, but it's different when you see it directly. So I'm curious to see if we'll get to see the Air Nomads as well. We do get to see the Air Nomads. Oh no. I feel like this is gonna be really sad. Look at his outfit! Sorry, it looks so good! Oh, he's so cute. He's got some strong eyebrows. This is our introduction to Aang. He's our titular character. Good as cheese. Show off. What? I was just enjoying the bit. Huh. Monk Suta was looking for you. You skipped training again. It's all the same drills. You know how I know all this stuff. And you may be more advanced than the others. This much you have to learn. And believe it or not, there may come a day when you wish you'd spend more time with your teachers. That's foreshadowing and we don't like it. Look at the designs in his tattoo. Now, you and the other students better go help set up the, the Great Comet so Festival. Great. There's still a lot of work to be done before the air nomads from the other temples arrive. How many are coming? No, this is so sad. Look at all the bison! I love flying bison. They're so cool. I want to flying bison. Oh man, no, mm -mm. no, 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 no. This is so sad. Why is it sad? Because I know what's gonna happen. If you don't know the story, then you don't know. It's not sad yet, but it will be. So when I talked before about scenes hitting differently when they're in flashback versus when you're seeing them directly. This is what I mean. Oh man, okay. In the original series, we we see what happened to the Air Nomads through flashbacks. So it's not quite the same because we're not like there in the story with the characters. We're seeing it like, oh, these are Aang's memories. We're, we're removed from it. It's distant from us. Even though it's still sad, it's like, that's 
like Aang remembering we weren't there. He was there. So we're sad for him, but we're not sad because we weren't there. Does that make sense? But when you see the scenes themselves and you're there in the scene with the characters, it's like it becomes your memory too. And you get attached to Monk Kiazzo and you just love the world of the Air Nomads. And then when the Fire Nation comes and destroys it all, it's just like going to rip your heart out even more. So I think that's really strategic as a place to start this story because it's very emotionally heightened, it's intense, and it reverses your expectations. So you think the story is going one way and then you're immediately hit with a very strong emotional punch and that'll hopefully grip us to watching the rest of the story. But it's, I think it's a pretty, in terms of where to start this story, it makes a lot of sense. And it sets a tone for the rest of it. So there's a lot of fighting in this series, there's a lot of action, so it sets that up as well as a precedent, which is cool. And it more immediately introduces us to how cool bending is, because it's only the first five minutes or so, and we've seen earth bending, fire bending, and air bending. So that's cool. And you are the avatar. The Fire Nation is embarked on a dark path. Their actions threaten to throw the world out of balance. Only the Avatar, the one person who can master all four elements, can save the world. There we get the invi- the, the world needs the Avatar. There we get the introduction to the quest, the hero's quest. That is what he's going to have to do throughout the course of the story. He's the Avatar. He's going to have to master all four elements and save the world. So if you're plotting a story, even if it's not fantasy like this, you can think of it like the moment when the theme is stated. So usually in the first couple of chapters, a secondary character states the theme that the story is basically going to be about. And it kind of just gives your reader a hint. This is sort of like what they're doing here. So Kiatsu is the side character who is stating the theme or the purpose or the quest for Aang. And if Aang aligns with conventional storytelling, he should push back against that because your main character should not want anything to do with the theme at the beginning of the story or their quest. So let's see what he does. The world needs you, Aang. You should leave right away so you can begin training in the other disciplines. Oh, he'll leave right away. Right away? Leave my friends? Leave home? Leave you? Now this would be a huge burden for anyone. Ugh, the irony is painful. But you're not just anyone, Anne. You're strong. And kind. And generous. Remember that. Why do I feel like he's going to flash back to that moment with Kiazzo in later episodes? Oh, okay, we're going to have to skip ahead a little bit. So Aang's basically like, no, I don't want to be the Avatar. I'm going to go run away and hide on my flying bison. Meanwhile, the Fire Nation attacks and kills all the air nomads, which seriously hits different. Like, it hits... It hits way different. It was meant to, based on how it was written. And then Aang and Appa get trapped in this storm. So, so far, Aang... We get a little bit of his playfulness, and we get a little bit of his serious side. But he's reading a little bit more serious to me. Aang in the animated series was really goofy, and he felt more innocent and silly. This Aang feels more, like, calm and reserved. So I think that's probably an intentional choice because it's hard for silliness to read the same in animation versus live action. Because in animation, you can make facial expressions that are just wild and out there. The jokes can land differently. So I think that's an intentional choice, but I do think it takes a little bit away from the character. So let's see what Katara and Sokka are like. Look at how big the village is. All right, listen up. It's probably more realistic. We've been manning the wall in three hour shifts, but it seems some of you can't be trusted to stay at your posts. He looks so like from Sokka. from now on, two people at all times, meaning twice as many shifts. Is there a problem? Didn't think so. Okay, back to your duties. Interesting. Come on, let's go. Where are we going? The fishing boats came back empty. Just proves if you want something done right, you gotta do it yourself. Ooh, interesting. Okay, so we get the replay of the animated scene where Sokka is talking to the warriors of the village and it's like all a bunch of little toddlers. These kids are a little bit older and so it doesn't read as funny. It reads more serious. So does Sokka, which I think is really interesting. I mean, we've only seen him say, like, a couple things, but he seems, he seems more serious. Okay, I'm going to, anyway, let's play, let's keep going. And they just don't appreciate your incredible leadership skills. That's right, they don't realize it. Very funny. <laughs> yeah, he's got, like, a little bit of a bite. Katara! 
Here's the one, the scene that matches the oh, opening of the animated series. You were waterbending again, weren't you? Don't worry. No one could see me. Not that it matters. Of course it matters. If anyone from the Fire Nation finds out you're a waterbender... No one from the Fire Nation has approached the village in years. Besides, there's nothing to see. An otter penguin could bend more water than I could. It's probably for the best. You should be helping out more around the village anyway. Not everything is about preparing to fight. We're at war. Waterbending is what built our culture. Our way of life. Keeping it alive is our duty. Keeping ourselves alive is our duty. I know that. And if Dad were here... But he's not here. I am. Okay, so this scene matches the scene in the animated series where they're on the boat fishing. The difference is it's lost a lot of its silliness. Its lightness, I should say. So in the opening of the animated series, Sokka's like, Katara, how come every time you play with magic water, I get soaked? And it's a joke, but it tells us a little bit about his understanding of water bending. And Katara's like, it's not magic, it's water bending, blah, 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 blah. Here, it's much more serious. Like, you can't bend. We're supposed to be protecting the village. That's our job. You should be doing this. So it's just, it's rooted a little bit more in like, I feel like the darkness of the story and the reality of what it would be like for people who are living in the midst of a war. So I think that's probably a really smart choice in terms of how to write this story for live action. Because again, in, in, an, in a cartoon, you kind of expect it to be lighter and not as serious. So you can play with ideas like war and refugees and all of that with a little bit more lightness. But in a live action, that probably wouldn't read so well. I do feel like Katara doesn't come across as firm. Like in the animated series, she is a bossy, headstrong girl. And here we're getting her pushing back on Sokka. But I don't know if it's just this girl's acting or something but she just seems more reserved and so um, i'm kind of just interested to see how that plays out Sokka's character is coming across strong i would say so far he seems proud stressed <laughs> and like he's wearing a lot of responsibility on his shoulders which makes a lot of sense so okay cool interesting oh my gosh <laughs> You okay? Oh no, no, no. That's not good. So there we get a conflict or an obstacle where the boat's drifting that? away, similar to what we had before in the animated series. Oh, weird. I'm curious to see how they play this scene because in the animated series, Sokka is like a little bit misogynistic <laughs> and Katara gets really mad and starts like just fuming at him and she accidentally water bends really hard and like breaks open the encasement that Aang is in. So I'm curious to see what they do with that here. We need to get that canoe or we're gonna end up as fish food. Yeah, Probably like polar bear food. Oh, we're switching. <gasps> Zuko! Where are you? Oh, what are they gonna do with Uncle Iroh? Oh man. You gotta get Iroh right. You gotta get him right. It's a lot of pollution here. Pumping into the old airways. He's obsessed. Oh, that's so interesting. We only get that tiny little picture of Prince Zuko and what it will tell us is that he's obsessed with finding the avatar because we see his he, we see him drawing the avatar we see him uh having like <laughs> like a murder mystery panel on his wall where you're connecting all the threads that's it and then we flash back okay how would you know how to water bend if there was no one to teach you like you... Uh, Tara? Oh, he's got all the figurines of the old avatars and they glow. It's interesting. Why do they glow? Finally. Zuko! Wow, okay, that was anticlimactic. Um, 
Huh. Was it her action of water bending that like awakened him into the avatar state? I don't like how that just didn't feel connected at all. Like somehow she's trying to water bend the boat and then for some reason the orb explodes. Like, it's not as clear the cause and effect as it was in the animated. And I feel like that's kind of a bummer because really it just feels like, oh, they just happened to end up by this iceberg and it just happened to erupt right at that moment. I don't know if it was because of her bending, but it doesn't seem like that really. In the cartoon, it's like very clearly like she cracks it open. So that's a bummer, but okay. Let's skip ahead a little bit. <laughs> Aang is invited into the Water Tribe. Everyone in the village knows this story, but you don't, do you, young man? Just as you don't know that airbenders haven't been seen in generations and that the Southern Air Temple was the first to fall because you've been trapped in that ice this whole time. The last time that the Great Comet was seen so in the comet was 100 years ago. Where is he going? He may seem like just a boy. So because the story was set up 100 years ago and we got to be part of the Air Nomad tribe for a little bit and hang out in the Eastern Air, I mean the Southern Air Temple for a little while, because of that, these moments hit more emotionally for us. And that's helpful because the characters aren't really giving us a lot of emotion. Like we don't know exactly what Aang is thinking, but we can feel potentially what he's feeling because we feel it too. Like the air nomads were so beautiful and they were like, what a cool place it was. And it was a community and then it was all wiped out and we saw that. And now we're realizing like they haven't been around for a hundred years. They were completely wiped out and Aang is the only one. And it just resonates a lot more because it's not flashing back. It put us in those scenes. So I think that was a really great choice, as I said before. Okay, let's skip ahead a little bit. Where's Iroh? I'm a warrior. They say Avatar Kyoshi took down an entire squadron of Earth Kingdom soldiers single-handedly. Well, you certainly prepared enough. Now, how about a nice cup of that, jasmine tea? That's from, um, oh my gosh, what's his name? Paul Sun Hyung Lee, right? The dad from Kim's Convenience? Stop. He's Uncle Iroh! That's impossible. <laughs> Stop. That's awesome. Say we find the Avatar and you're able to defeat him. A mission your father believed to be impossible. And so your return home may be unexpected. You're wrong. Okay, well, that just didn't, that kind of fell flat for me. I think the, intro, the original introduction to Iroh and Zuko is so perfect. Like, I'm just flashing back to, I don't need any calming tea. <laughs> Please sit. Why don't you enjoy a cup of calming jasmine tea? I don't need any calming tea! The dialogue is so natural. I think Iroh's accent, like the way he talked, his voice, is really distinct. What would Uncle do? Uncle, you have to look within yourself to save yourself from your other self. So having this actor not kind of try to recreate that, I feel like was a choice that I don't think I really like. His lines just don't hit with the same kind of like impact and wisdom, but it's okay. Maybe they will later on. I feel like I'm not buying their connection yet. The chemistry seems a little strange to me. That could just be the acting, I'm, I'm not sure, but there's something off about that scene. Let me know what you think, okay. It's almost like Iroh is trying to be wise in this version. Like they're writing him trying to make him sound wise and profound. Whereas in the original, it was like, he wasn't, it wasn't really like that. He was kind of silly and sweet and funny, but then he was also really wise as well. But it was like, I don't know, it just landed different. I'd have to look back at, maybe I'll do a case study on the two Iros and see what's causing the kerfuffle in my brain, but. If this is the path you've chosen, then so be it. Look at <laughs> their uniforms. Leader to leader. You really need an army? I thought you firebenders had some guts. Uh, we overpower them. Malik. It's no contest. Well, where's the glory in that? Zuko does want glory. Accept. Character motivation. <laughs> Saga's like, oh, never mind. Okay, so this one is extending, obviously, beyond where the animated series ended. So let's see where this one ends. Aang decides to go 
willingly with Prince Zuko. Iroh talks to Aang in prison. Okay, Aang escapes and then they go to the Eastern Air Temple. It's held up pretty well for a hundred years, honestly. That's fine. Now this would be a huge burden for anyone. Oh, here it is, the flashbacks, coming already. Man. You're strong, <gasps> and kind, and generous. <gasps> remember that. <laughs> Always remember who you are. <sighs> oh man, he's gonna lose it. That looks so cool. That moment is giving Peter Parker and Uncle Ben from Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> Just rip my heart out. Okay, it's fine. But see, it's way more emotional because we it was like we knew him too, you know? And we saw him die. So it's really, it hurts more, which I love. It's great. Okay. I don't know where this will all lead. And I don't know if I have what it takes. But the one thing I do know is... I'm the Avatar. And this You're is so just cute. the beginning. They still end on a glimpse of Zuko, which is cool. Okay, so the story ends with Aang accepting the call to action and accepting his quest, which... That's fast, but it makes sense, I think seeing your old home in ruins would evoke that kind of feeling. But I hope in episodes to come that there's still a little bit of pushback in him of like, oh, I don't know if I can be the Avatar. I don't know if I can do it. Because if he just goes from like, I don't want to be the Avatar to this is my quest, this is my responsibility, that's a little bit fast for your character development. Okay, so that was episode one. Honestly, I have to watch a few more. <laughs> I have some mixed feelings about it. I think the writing... Man, it's just tricky because you can't recreate the animated series 100%. You can't make the characters exactly the same. You can't make the story exactly the same because it's not going to land the same. But at the same time, when a sto original story is so beloved, how do you recreate it in a way where it does justice to the original, but it's also well-suited for live action and for a new audience? But I would say there's some things that worked really well. Starting the story in media res, in the middle of an action scene where we get to see a lot of bending, that's super cool because we're like, whoa, this is amazing. Starting it with the Fire Nation getting ready to attack the Air Nomads, and then we get to see the Air Nomads and live in that world for a little bit. We get to see Aang, find out he's the Avatar, and then we get to see it all crumble into pieces when the Fire Nation destroys the Air Nomads. I think that's a really smart writing choice. It gives the content of the story the weight it deserves, I feel like. So I liked that. What I didn't like as much is the character development and the voices. Like when I watched the animated version, it was so clear what the, what each character was like. Like you knew, oh, okay, Sokka is kind of goofy and headstrong, but he's actually seems really insecure. Katara is kind of bossy. She's also headstrong, but she's really tough. Zuko is headstrong. Wait a second. <laughs> Zuko is really determined, he's hot-headed, but he's like desperately wants his father's approval. Iroh is, puts up with all that and is calm but wise, tries to be a voice of reason, but he's also kind of silly. Aang is super goofy, totally a 12-year-old kid, you know, just very innocent, and is really blindsided by the reality of what he learns. So that's all really clear in the animated series. In this series, I feel like the characters felt more monotone and I think that that's a shame. I would say of all the characters, Sokka maybe had the most distinct personality, maybe also Zuko, but the rest of them were kind of like, oh, okay, yeah. Nothing too like distinct about them. Um, so I'm curious to see what it's like in future episodes, but. Anyway, so just an interesting look at telling the same story in two different ways. I mean, we don't really get to see that done very often. I mean, except with all the live action Disney remakes, but. So maybe we do get to see it a lot. Within books, at least, you don't really get to see the same book written in two different ways, right? So it's cool to see a story written in two different ways and how that shapes how you feel as a viewer or a reader. Let me know what you thought. Do you prefer the live action or the animated? Should I even be asking that question or is it too controversial? I don't know.
But otherwise, thanks so much for watching. It was so good to see you today, and I will see you next time. Take care.